our top story today will go down in history as the day the world's seventh billionth human was born, at least symbolically, because it's impossible to accurately identify the seventh billionth baby, and whether indeed today is the day. However, the symbolism is important because it focuses on the speed with which the global population is growing. We crossed from six to seven billion in less than 13 years, and most of this growth is in the developing world, where there's already a struggle for scarce resources. In India. It was Nargis, born in India's most populated state, Uttar Pradesh, who was chosen symbolically as the country's seventh billionth baby. Several other countries too marked the occasion with specific babies. There isn't, however, just one message in this exercise, but many, from the fragile sex ratio to food and health security, scarce resources, family planning for women, and also the shifting economic advantages based on this growing population or demographic dividends that East Asian and South Asian countries are meant to have. Little Nargis came to this world at the crack of dawn, symbolizing a historic high for the world population, 7 billion and counting, and also a warning that the planet's resources will soon be stretched to the limit. But for the new parents, it was a moment of pure joy. Nargis is India's symbolic 7 billionth child. Her birth a matter of great pride for her parents. But there are several girls in India who are killed in the womb or abandoned in garbage dumps left there to die. And it's this attitude towards the girl child that these people are hoping to change on a day when the population clock of the world has hit the 7 billion mark. While India has one of the world's youngest populations, giving it an edge over China, parts of Europe and even the United States, experts say inadequate food, health and educational resources is turning it into a curse. Nargis will attend school and lead a better life, thanks to social organizations. 2011 figures suggest that in Uttar Pradesh alone, 536 are killed every day. We really want to bring attention to the cause of gender discrimination and uh, female feticide that is so prevalent. On a day several countries welcomed their 7 billionth baby, more than a dozen mothers had been marked just in Uttar Pradesh, India's most popular state. Among them was 25-year-old Pinky Panwar, who became an overnight celebrity in and around her village. But Pinky didn't deliver, and the benefits of becoming a population statistic were lost to the family. This village of 11,000 is specially notorious for its missing girl child. It almost built itself to a peeply live moment when the news of the 7th billion child of the world being born in India's most popular state began doing the rounds. An otherwise quiet village, happy with all the international attention, not just the milestone tag, but hoping their issues will be for the world to see. With Ume Kulsum Sharif in Bagpat in Lucknow, Anand Zanane for NDTV. Let's just look at some of the interesting facts in the big picture. In about 14 years, India is expected to overtake China as the most populous country in the world. At the other extreme, Europe will have far fewer people as birth rates here are falling rapidly. So the billion dollar, the seven billion dollar question perhaps are whether seven billion humans and India's 1.21 billion humans, is this a demographic dividend or potential time bomb? The UN makes the point that this is the time to act, that there has to be investment in policy, there has to be change to make sure that we can actually use these numbers well and make sure that the next uh, 10 years or the next 13 years doesn't show the next billion coming up. I will joining me on my special debate tonight. I've also got a, a young girl, an 11-year-old, Asta Arora, who was India's one billionth baby girl. She's 11 years old now, all grown up. Asta, thank you for joining me. And also joining me tonight, I'm joined by Mr. K. Chandramoli, Registrar General and Census Commissioner of India, who had that huge task of counting India's people with that census 2011. I'm also joined by Shabana Azmi, well-known actress and social activist from Mumbai. Also with me is Dr. Sunita Narayan at the Center of Science and Environment. But today she's also an ambassador for NGO Plan India. She's adopted one of the baby girls born today to sponsor her education and health care till she's a major. Thank you all very much for joining me. I'll go across to Asta first as uh, the first part of my debate for the rest of my panel. Asa, what do you feel when people say you were India's one billionth baby? 
I feel that I am uh, I, uh, my friends are saying about the billion baby so I feel very happy uh, and और बहुत सारे वो न्यूज वाले भी आते हैं और मुझे बहुत I feel very happy तो आज था आज टुडे व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट द वर्ल्ड हैविंग सेवन बिलियन पीपल व्हाट वुड यू से पॉपुलेशन फिगर्स एटसेट्रा आई मीन योर अ यंग गर्ल कून मीन दैट मच बट सेवन बिलियन व्हाट डू यू थिंक मेरे को ये लगता है कि इतने पॉपुलेशन इतनी बढ़ जाएगी तो फिर जो लोग लोगों को घर नहीं मिलेंगे घर नहीं मिलेंगे तो फिर वो सड़क पे कहीं भी बीच में बैठ जाएंगे तो फिर वो गाड़ियां बाइक स्कूटर वगैरह ट्रांसपोर्ट वगैरह कहां से जाएंगे और फिर और ज्यादा भीड़ बढ़ती ही जाएगी आस्था और आज हमने देखा कि आप भी उत्तर प्रदेश से हैं और आज उत्तर प्रदेश में भी इंडिया चोज द सेवन बिलियन बेबी लिटिल बेबी गर्ल कॉल्ड नार्गिस इसके बारे में आप क्या कहेंगे मुझे भी नहीं कि उसकी भी प्रॉमिसेस पूरी कर पाएंगी आसाद वेन यू वर बोर्न इट्स ट्रू बिकॉज इतना फोकस था आप पे एंड योर पेरेंट्स पर प्रॉमिस थिंग वॉट इज द गवर्नमेंट ने क्या प्रॉमिस किया था आपको और आपके पेरेंट्स को जब मैं वन बिलियन में भी बनी थी सरकार ने मेरे से बहुत सारे प्रोमिस करे थे कि मेरी स्कूल फीस माफ होगी स्कूल फीस माफ है लेकिन वो स्कूल की तरफ से माफ है गवर्नमेंट की तरफ से माफ नहीं है और मेरी मेडिकल फीस ट्रेवलिंग फीस ये सब भी बिल्कुल माफ नहीं हुई है तो और सेवन बिलियन बेबी मुझे नहीं लगता है कि सेवन बेबी सेवन बिलियन बेबी की कोई प्रोमिस पूरी कर पाएंगी गवर्नमेंट आज तक तो फाइनली आप क्या कहेंगे आज आप क्या सरकार से क्या कहना चाहेंगे वॉट वुड यू लाइक टू से एवरीबडी इज वॉचिंग यू टूडे मैं यही कहना चाहूंगी कि आगे जो आगे सेवन बिलियन बेबी जो भी बने उस उसकी गव, उसके गवर्नमेंट सारी प्रोमिस कंप्लीट करे और कोशिश हो कि मेरी भी प्रोमिस जो भी हैं वो भी कंप्लीट होए आस्था थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर जॉइनिंग अस टुडे द वन बिलियन बेबी नाउ वेल अ वेरी आर्टिकुलेट यंग गर्ल थैंक यू आस्था एंड मिस्टर चंद्र मौली वी सी द एक्सपेक्टेशन फ्रॉम द गवर्नमेंट आई मीन शी ऑफ कोर्स द वन बिलियन बेबी सो लॉट ऑफ फोकस ऑज ऑन हर बट द पॉइंट ऑफ एस्पिरेशन द पॉइंट ऑफ इंडियाज ह्यूज ग्रोइंग यंग पॉपुलेशन हु वॉन्ट एड बेटर एजुकेशन हु वॉन्ट जॉब्स how do we address that with numbers like this if you could just give us perhaps a brief interpretation of the global numbers and specific to india well if you take the population your whole theme today has been whether it's a boon or a bane mm -hmm. that would depend on how you look at it if you look at it from the angle of a very young population with aspirations as you rightly said and your graphic just uh, showed how the rest of the world is depicting in its population so if the young population is given the education and the right skills to meet the demands of the growing uh, developed nations then this could be easily turned into an opportunity whereas if the skills are lacking and the employability is uh, lacking then this very opportunity becomes a threat so it depends on the not only the numbers but also the quality of the numbers and that would be a major thing on how we handle the health situation how mm -hmm. we help the education system and how we handle the creation of infrastructure right and if i can bring in shibana azmi here mr chandramouli make the point on what the government should focus on <clears throat> but the reality is seeming so very different in a city like mumbai where you're from bursting at it seems uh, people uh, there inhabiting literally every square inch what is the main focus when you look at population today and also still the large number of unwanted babies we talk about a demographic div dividend but others talk and make the point that this is not empowerment women are not empowered to make choices which are relevant to them and what about the disappearing number of girl babies well firstly right from the cairo summit we have been saying that the word population control needs to be removed and replaced by population stabilization we need to understand that there is an inbuilt momentum in population because of which even or the people who are of marriageable age even if they have one child each you will not be able to stabilize the population till 2050 it has also been stated over and over again that when you look at the population issue as a time bomb ticking away then there are panic reactions which are taken which talk about coercive 
control measures which have not worked in countries where we have seen population stabilization taking place we have seen that women are empowered there is a variety of uh, 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 of uh, contraceptive choices women can negotiate uh, contraceptive uh, choices women are empowered society looks at women as people who need to have uh, they need to walk the talk and to be able to make take part in the decision making process so first we should negate the term population control and understand that yes of course it is a matter of serious concern but the way we need to deal with it is possibly not the insistence that has been on to uh, on on lowering the tfr mm -hmm. which is the total fertility rate because in a country like bangladesh where they have reduced the tfr by almost 50% it still continues to be a very poor uh, country That's so there are many other it. measures which it's interesting you made that yes. point because there are so many people saying that you know this is India's biggest problem. We need to be uh, more. Uh, we need to be tougher about this. And even looking back to those controversial Sanjay Gandhi days and saying at least he had identified the problem, the biggest problem India is facing is population. Many have criticized no, Gulam Nabi Azad. It's, it's, it's no, gone no, the full no, no. spectrum we, we, to Gulam Nabi Azad saying you know if you have TV then people won't make babies. Is that really the problem? There's a complete lack of consistency in our policy. No. Firstly, the understanding, the understanding which stems from that this is a time bomb ticking away, that needs to change. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that it is a serious issue that needs to be considered. But you cannot talk about measures like incentives and disincentives and say that uh, women who have three children will not be able to contest elections. They will be denied PDF. On the one hand, you are encouraging women to come into the political system. On the other, you are denying the woman the right to participate in decision making processes by doing something which is beyond her control because you know that in our country it is not women who make the choices right. the desire to have a male child is so extreme so extreme that it leads also to a female feticide which is a matter of grave concern and we have to look at female feticide and infanticide as murder which it is and not try to coach it by giving it all kinds of other social terms right dr narayan come in here at this point because you've actually are one of the people who are adopting a baby girl today to make that point that when we look at exploding numbers what about the imbalances within and where the disappearing girls are how crucial is that when we look at the demographic dividend if you look at it from the other end of the spectrum you know Everyone who works in the area of population and uh, birth control in particular will tell you that one of the biggest issues really is about women's empowerment and about the girl child. Because unless the girl child is educated, unless the girl child is empowered to take decisions, unless she's financially independent, you will not see stabilization of populations happen. And there's a clear correlation between the education of women and the stabilization of population. So I think it's very important for us, for every reason that we know of, that we need to make sure that we can provide basic services to our people. I keep hearing about this that, you know, it's because of the growing numbers of people that we cannot provide basic services and that we will run out of houses. I think the big issue for us is to understand that it's not because of the sheer numbers of people that we are not able to provide clean mm. drinking water or houses. It's because of just the sheer incompetence of our delivery systems or our policies. So we need to understand this as an opportunity. We we, of course, also need to make sure that because of growing numbers in the world, there are finite resources and you will have to find different approaches to be able to deal with that development pathway that you want. Mm -hmm. But equality of access and justice is going to be absolutely critical if you feel that you can deal with the issues of development. Mr. Shantamoli, as someone uh, from the government side, how big of a challenge is this? The fact that most of these numbers are in the developing world, India is going to be the world's largest uh, populated country within a few years from now. How much of a challenge is this for the government to keep up, as it were? I mean, it seems like you're almost a losing race. How will you keep up with this in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the investment that's needed uh, to, for this population? Well, I would like to take this debate slightly away from the focus of the government alone. Right. Because the government can at most provide an enabling environment where uh, access to education, access to health uh, could be made, you know, universal. And also that it could create a legal environment to protect the girl child. 
and make it illegal for feticides and uh, infanticides to take place. But it needs much more than government intervention. It would need a complete change in the mindset of the people where aspirations, as uh, was uh, rightly said, aspirations, a good education, especially female uh, literacy so on the rise. government policies have helped in Bihar, in Madhya Pradesh. We've Absolutely. seen uh, completely landmark government policies which have changed the concept Absolutely. of how the if you, if you see, child is treated. If you correlate what has come out in the census in terms of numbers of the literates going up, the gap between males and female literacy going down, and its impact on the growth rates in the country as a whole, and particularly in uh, Bihar and UP. I would like to give some statistics here that almost all the states which are the most populous states have shown a decline in the growth rate of population. Mm -hmm. And this is probably directly attributable to the growing literacy, growing awareness among females. Uh, it was rightly said that uh, they are not empowered, but education and rising aspirations would bring in that empowerment. In fact, the UN statement also said the aim today has to be that every man, woman, boy and girl is treated equally to really give them the chance to reap the benefits. Shibana Azmi, if I can bring you in here, the point we made on states where we've seen uh, proactive policies uh, for the girl child, like Bihar, like Madhya Pradesh, actually showing an impact on the ground. Population stabilization or control as it's, uh, is a very, very politically sensitive topic. It has religious ramifications. It has issues about women's empowerment. Do you see politically that this has really been given the place on the agenda that it needs to be? Is this a political priority for anyone in our government or in our country today? I think because of the forcible uh, sterilization programs in the past, the governments are wary and they are scared to take actual measures. And when they put their mind to it, they really don't think the thought through. And when they talk about disincentives, for me it is a matter of great concern, which I've talked about, that they'll cut off rationing and they'll cut off the ability to stand in elections. So I don't think it has been thought of correctly. We have to understand that when we are saying that we need empowerment of women, we need education, we recognize that a girl who is past the age standard is likely to have less children than somebody who hasn't gone to that state. These are statistics that have been proved over the years and I agree totally with Sunita that it is not a question that we don't have resources, it's a mismanagement of those resources and policies which are not stable in any way. One state says something else, another state somewhere else. Even in Tamil Nadu, in fact, there has been a huge improvement because the government took upon itself very seriously. Coming back to the issue of the missing girl child, I mean, the fact is that here in Maharashtra, I think in the early 90s when Sharad Pawar said uh, that um, uh, sex selection would be banned, it was because they did a systematic survey in which they realized that 98% cases of abortions were that of female fetuses. So until and unless society starts looking at the girl as an asset and not as a liability for which long-term measures have to be taken, in including we have to make sure that the sex selection centers, when we are saying that they are banned, then we actually have to make sure that people who have committed the crime are made, are punished for it. So there are several measures that need to be taken. Treat it as murder, the, the point you're making. Dr. Narayan, uh, as we wrap up this... It is murder. Yes, of course, and the, uh, treated in that way. Uh, Dr. Naran, as we end tonight, you made that point about the fact that even though most of the population uh, the growth is in the developing world, most of the resources are almost uh, uh, overtaken by the developed world. That's an inequality which is going to perhaps lead to much more rift as we see this young, uh, growing population with aspirations in the developing world. Is that a really a uh, fault line you're going to see as a major problem? Oh, absolutely, Sonia. I mean, 7% of the world's population today emits 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. You know, and that can be repeated with every resource. But I think it's also important in India because increasingly, even in India, we find that very few people actually uh, use most of the resources. Mm -hmm. And I think the big challenge for us in the future is going to be we do have large numbers. We will have to find a way to be able to build our cities in a way that we can provide for all and not some. A classic example is the roads of Delhi. I mean, today you have congestion in Delhi. We all talk about the fact with every population growth, how will we ever drive in Delhi? But the fact is only 13% of Delhi actually owns a car. The rest does not. So the big question is 
is if you move everyone to buses everyone will be able to move in delhi you move everyone to bus everybody will sit in a jam so that's the big challenge for the future the we will have large numbers of people we will have to find development strategies that can provide for all and not just some and that is global challenge and india's challenge right uh, smita narayan shabana azmi mr chandramouli thank you so much for joining me tonight on a debate which hopefully today at least at least the number will focus on these key issues needed in our by policy makers and society as well thank you very much for joining me and we'll go across sadly to politics as usual and it's back to the 2g scam and the crisis a fresh round of political trouble over the controversial 2g explanatory note by the prime minister's office and pandam mukherjee's finance ministry the note had effectively said that if mr chidambaram had stood his ground when he was finance minister the 2g scam could possibly have been prevented What was politically damaging to the government however was that Mr Mukherjee was deemed to have cleared the note however the government then denied that and said it was not cleared by Mr Mukherjee today however BJP members of the joint parliamentary committee have made a fresh allegation which would throw open the whole controversy once again Rahul Shrivastava has more on that Rahul uh, the JPC today had actually called to the senior most financial uh, bureaucrats in the country to discuss why that note hadn't made it to the JPC that opened a pandora's box what happened So yeah this is the note which was sent by Mr Pranab Mukherjee's office the finance ministry to the PMO which created a storm and then two ministers walked out and said all is well but it seems all was not really well because if we go into the backdrop of how this whole document was created this is the mother note this is the note which was initially prepared by the finance ministry officials and if you see you have Mr Pranab Mukherjee's signature here and if you see what the documents which have been submitted in the jpc to, uh, for perusal is that there is a handwritten word perusal written here mm -hmm. and the line says that put up to finance minister for his perusal now this word perusal somewhere it seems a very ham job by somebody in the government because if one looks at the cover note the cover note says that put up to finance minister for his approval that means the uh, today that's exactly what the uh, bjp leaders uh, noticed that the word approval was replaced by the word perusal not only this sonia there is something very interesting in this letter is that there were if there were two uh, clarifications sent by the finance ministry to the pac last year in 2010 now in this note which is being prepared as a chronology of events it says that there are differences in interpretations variances in interpretation what it means that somewhere the finance ministry was realizing sometime in march this year after discussing with the cabinet secretariat and the prime minister's office that what was written to the psc in june 2010 was not exactly the correct picture but the picture needed to be corrected and eventually the final result was a note which came out and perhaps it will keep reverberating in the saga in the sarkari circles because what we are hearing that there are several other damaging documents in which there are several other confusions perhaps it's increasingly becoming clear that not only there was something wrong during the 2g spectrum allocation but perhaps also the government is failing to come out with a harmonized reaction to what the public and the courts and the various investigating agencies wants to know right rahul and all the difference in a word between approval and perusal so clearly now let's have, find out who that official is who overwrote that it really seems to become indicated by the day well, let me go across now to our news maker i spoke earlier before uh, rahul's uh, story of course i spoke earlier this evening to the chairman of the joint parliamentary committee to mr pc chako kerala congress mp and uh, i began by missing uh, by asking mr chako on what exactly happened uh, today on that uh, the crucial clarification made on that 2g note by two top financial bureaucrats mr gujral and mr gopalan mr chako what exactly is the clarification on why this note had been submitted to the jpc Mr. R. S. Gujarat and Mr. Gopal and Secretary Finance and also Secretary Economic Affairs, both of them were with us uh, today, and they explained that you know this uh, all the basic facts um, which led to the compilation of this note dated 25th March. Uh, all the files were made available to the committee. and all these facts were presented before the committee during their presentation when the finance ministry made their presentation to the committee in july this year so that was available to the committee that was their impression so this note was only a compilation of all the facts right. available all the facts given to the committee so they did not uh, feel this necessary to give this note no, because this was only a repetition or a compilation of the facts from the file this is their explanation 
But Mr. Chaku, you're saying it's their explanation, but uh, clearly the, the opposition members of the JPC weren't satisfied with this explanation at all. Uh, no, in fact, you know, we wanted more uh, uh, files and more information uh, which they have mentioned in the note. You know, this note dated 25th March, there is reference uh, in this note, there is reference of uh, some files and some records. And also there was an annexure to the um, this, uh, to, um, this 25th March note which was sent to us. Mm -hmm. In that annexure, there is a long list of records which they have mentioned also. And the committee wanted all those records to be supplied to the committee. Right. Uh, sir, of course, uh, you're saying the committee is asked for lots more, but there has often been a clear political divide in the parliamentary panel. Opposition members have maintained that they think that the then finance minister, the home minister, uh, the current home minister, Mr. Chidambaram, should be summoned in front of the JPC. W what is the latest on that? No, in fact, nobody raised that issue today. We did not go into the merit of that note, you know. What is the conclusion in the note? What is... But, yes, but sir, it has been raised earlier, hasn't it? No, we have not. Uh, today, it was uh, the limited question was why this was not made available to the committee. That was the only question explained to the committee by the uh, finance ministry officials. And we did not go into the details of the note. We did not go into the conclusions or the deals, details of the note. Mm -hmm. So that question did not come up at all. But sir, it has come up earlier. And just to ask, what is your view on this? Do you think there is enough cause for the then finance minister, uh, Mr. Chidambaram, to be called in front of the JPC? No, no, we have not come. These uh, things are to be decided collectively by the committee. It can, mm -hmm. We can come to that conclusion only after we discuss the issue in detail, you know. We did not discuss. Maybe some members might have uh, made that uh, point, but that is only a personal opinion, you know. Whatever we act is on the collective uh, opinion of the committee. Uh, to call anybody, even a minister, that we have to discuss in the committee. We have not discussed uh, of calling a minister. Right. So you're saying that's not come up yet, but we've seen, sir, what happened in an almost parallel meeting today of the uh, PSC, where Congress members disrupted it and said that they, uh, the meeting should not happen because a deputy had been called in the presence of the CAG about the question of how much the actual sum loss there was in the, in the CAG scam. Do you feel that the parliamentary panels now, both the PAC and the JPC, are becoming politi politicized? Are party members, are members reacting according to party lines, especially after we saw what happened today when the PAC was disrupted? Uh, no, Sonia, in fact, you know, I do not want to comment on another committee, especially a committee headed by a senior person like Purli Manohar Joshi. From the very beginning, I was of the opinion that, you know, a committee was constituted by the parliament, a joint parliamentary committee, go into the exclusive issue of 2G uh, spectrum and 2G scandal. So then other committees examining the same issue should have left this issue to the job JPC. Otherwise, there is no point. I personally met Mr. Murli Manohar Joshi. I requested him that, you know, since the JPC is looking into this issue, mm -hmm. it may be unnecessary duplication that two committees are looking into the same issue. Well, the, the government, uh, the Congress has said and uh, members within the uh, JPC and the PAC of the, of, of the UP have also made the point that the issue about how much the actual loss was is crucial. We know that the CAG is now going to be called on the 14th of November. What's the progress that has been made on this determining of the actual loss of the 2G scam? No, that we will discuss, you know, that's a very, very important point, you know, because how much this country has lost, whether this country has lost, if so, how much they have lost is a very important question. That is why the whole people are waiting for this committee report. So we have to come to that decision. I cannot say offhand, but we will definitely examine. So we will first ask the Sian Deji who came to this conclusion that this loss is, a, uh, is X amount. So how they came to this conclusion, that is what we are going to ask them. If it is presumptive laws or actual laws, how they calculated, how they arrived at the conclusion, mm -hmm. that they have to explain to us. This committee has to tell to the parliament and to the people. Well, so you mentioned the people, but for the people, the worry is that with so many parallel committees, so many agencies investigating, so many figures floating around, the doubt remains whether there will actually be tough action taken. 
you know in fact you know when the jpc was appointed all these doubts were there you know at that point of time differing views were there that you know when there was a demand for jpc there was a general consensus for jpc also there were opinions that you know the same issue is being inquired by uh, court inquired by cbi inquired by various other agencies including the public accounts committee so multiplicity of agencies are inquiring into the same issue is not necessary that was one view anyway the collective wisdom of the parliament was that you know even though there are many other agencies looking into the same issue the most appropriate forum uh, the agency is the joint parliament committee so the joint parliament committee should inquire that was the parliament decision so we are interested this task right but uh, mr chakud uh, to repeat the question I asked will there eventually be tough action if you get any evidence how far can it go right to the top the opposition keeps making the point that why haven't you called the then finance minister should the prime minister also be questioned you made the point uh, when you took over that we can ask anyone questions even if it's the prime minister will this go right to the top what do you see as chairman of the jpc no in fact you know normally the committees are functioning they uh, take evidence from the department secretaries and they take evidence from the files you know more than individuals it is the files that speaks in every department in any department whatever information is available the files we can summon only after perusing the files if we are not satisfied if we feel that it can come only from an individual then only we call that individual whether he is a minister or a secretary or whoever it is so our job is not to not a witch hunting you know we want to arrive at the truth so we are trying to that's what i said that you know in the course of our discussion if we feel that x should be called or y should be called at that point of time we will decide we will collectively decide to do that Mr Chako thank you so much for joining me tonight our job is not a witch hunt let's see how that's interpreted but the main focus is the truth mr chako says let's see how the opposition reacts to that meanwhile the other news on 2g and that's of course the court case the supreme court today questioned the central bureau of investigation on its flip flops on their reaction to the bail plea of five of the 2g scam accused including dmk mp kani moi the top court asked the cbi to clarify after ram jethmalani who is representing unitex sanjay chandra said the cbi had not objected to bail for these five accused in the trial court the court told the cbi if that is so what happens to the economic fabric theory the court said then you are sure that they will not tamper with evidence so why should why should the judge keep them behind bars then so the cbi now has to answer this however they told the supreme court they are opposing bail at the moment Our the top story tonight the West Bengal governor today expressed concern over the deaths of infants in West Bengal so far the chief minister mamta banerjee is also the health minister hasn't ex- hasn't said anything about the spate of infant deaths uh, deaths in two hospitals in burdwan and in kolkata the minister of state for health sudeep andupadhyay meanwhile today inaugurated a neonatal unit at the bc roy hospital and gave both the hospital and doctors a clean chit today 41 babies dead in just one week all of them admitted in these two government hospitals of west bengal the health portfolio is with the chief minister herself but is the west bengal government in denial i am totally giving them clean chit because i believe that this is not due to negligence of the authority in fact mortality rate in west bengal is 33 per 1000 live births কিন্তু আমি আপনাদেরকে বলতে চাই যে এই ভারতবর্ষে এমন রাজ্য আছে যেখানে এই সংখ্যা ষাটকে অতিক্রম করে আমরা তো থার্টি থ্রিতে আছি The minister inaugurating a brand new 30 bed sick newborn care unit at BC Roy Hospital but this is the reality check both BC Roy and Burdwan government hospitals have overcrowded wards no CT scan machines no blood banks Last week Burdwan had 154 infants in a 60 bed ward and that is not the exception but the rule I am extremely ashamed and shocked and dismayed that my visit to this hospital has provided some new details because the media is not being allowed in seeing the wards The chief minister has so far refused to take any questions on this issue but the pressure is building up Of course it's a cause of concern and we need to look at this unfortunate tragedy much more than the inquiry we need to ensure that another person another child does not die 
After 41 deaths in just one week in just two government hospitals, many are asking if the governor is asking for too much. In Kolkata with Jiri Shankar, Monidhar Banerjee, NDTV. Moving on, on the 27th death anniversary of former Prime